In mid-August, the U.S. Census Bureau released the data necessary for states to begin the work of updating the legislative and congressional district maps in a process called redistricting. Senator Mark Johnson, chair of the Senate Redistricting Committee, joins me to talk more about the process. Thanks for being here. Uh, hi, Shannon. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back in studio yes. uh, doing this once again. Yes, it is. Um, let's begin with the logistics of the process. The Senate sure. is holding hearings. The House is holding hearings. At what point will the committee begin drawing maps and how will differences between the House and Senate be reconciled? Sure. So uh, this, is, this has been such a unique process. First of all, once every 10 years this happens to begin with. It hasn't fallen on a pandemic year like this since, you know, back in the 1920s. So uh, it's really, uh, we're having some real issues with data. You know, think about the, the folks who are out there working, developing that data, going door to door. Uh, trying to see who was home during this whole census taking. You know, you're worried about opening the door to strangers and, and the whole, just the whole works was, was uh, pretty unique. So it pushed back the collection of that data uh, quite a bit. The information we should have been seeing back in February and April and March uh, didn't come until, you know, we, we heard about the apportionment for the federal seats in, I think it was June when we actually heard about those, and then uh, August, then we got the information for uh, the actual data that we can be using to draw maps. Uh, and so everything has been so much uh, further delayed. The hearings that we've had, you know, should have been done earlier in the year, but without the data, it's hard to know where we need to be and, and to see where some of the changes are going to be across the state. Well, that said, you did have one in Bemidji recently. We did, yeah. So what did you take away from that? What did you hear from residents of that area? Yeah, and, and that was really, that was uh, just wonderful to go out and hear. It's not so much for, for us to go out and educate people uh, about, you know, here's how the maps are going to be looking, but going there to understand the communities that we're going to be, uh, you know, affecting through this map drawing process. So, so everybody from, you know, counties to townships to, uh, we had some uh, tribes coming, they were, they were testifying, just all these different folks who have an interest in seeing uh, how their communities are going to be either joined up or split or, or how it's going to look. Um, so we got to learn more about that particular area and what was interest, uh, what interest they had in redistricting. And, and that's our plan going forward too, is, is stopping at different areas. We've got one set for Lakeville here, I think it's September 30th, where we're again going out and educating ourselves on what's important about this area. And, and we want to do that to get a flavor of Minnesota. Because uh, we all come from different areas, right? I mean, Think one of the makeup. Of, yeah. Right. And one of my takeaways from watching that Bemidji meeting is they're really concerned about rural representation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the census data shows that 78% of Minnesota's population growth did occur in the seven county Twin Cities metro area. And many people assume then that means there will be more districts in the Twin Cities. But, uh, you know, there's the, oh. the balance with rural areas and rural representation and the uniqueness that those rural areas have. So I, I wonder how you're thinking about that. Yeah. Well, it, it is interesting because, you know, we're, we're before our state was, was more spread out, as far as population was more evenly spread across the state to, to some, you know, respect. But you see now, especially in the seven county metro where that's really consolidating um, and I think rural Minnesota is, needs to gain a, somewhere between 50 and 60,000 seats to become our ideal district sizes, whereas a metro needs to shed about that amount. You know? So it, it's, it, a lot of that is going to be moving in towards the cities, which you know, it, it's a numbers game. I mean, it's absolutely about the numbers, and districts have to represent evenly the numbers. So 67 districts and divide that by the, the number of people living in the state. So it's clearly, you know, our, our rural districts are gonna become larger districts. I already have, in my district where I drive from corner to corner, it's a three hour drive. Uh, in my district, and you have some of the, in the cities here where that might be a 20 minute drive or something like that. Um, but it, it's just the nature of redistricting and the nature of population growth. So we want to make sure that it's fair. The process is fair. The representation is fair. And Minnesota has done a really good job of that. Think about whether it's the House or the Senate or the governor's office and how many times each of those bodies have switched between an R and a D 
uh, in the last 10, 20 years. I mean, I think uh, what, what we've done in redistricting in the past has been very effective for representing both sides of the political interest in the state. So um, that's something that we're going to continue uh, to do in a very fair and open way. And that's why we're doing all these procedures publicly and, and getting the input from everybody. It's not, not just directed to one particular side. So this is also going to, this population change, shifting populations and, and the growth mm -hmm. around urban areas is also impacting the congressional districts, which fortunately, yeah. according to Susan Brower, who was on the program last week, Minnesota State Demographer, Minnesota did a fantastic job yeah. of completing their census forms so that we get to maintain our eight congressional representatives. Yeah. But how, you know, as you sort of mentioned, there's innumerable ways to redraw these districts. And what are maybe some of the factors that are going to help you determine how the shape of these districts changes going forward? Sure. Yeah, Minnesota, first of all, congratulations to Minnesotans who got that done. Because we beat uh, New York, the, the state of New York, by 89 people to maintain our eight congressional districts, which is a big deal. I, I don't know if people realize how big or if this is getting too much into the, the weeds of, of redistricting. Well, it was close. <laughs> it was certainly <laughs> so, close, yes. It, it just amazes me how thin the margin was between us maintaining that eighth seat and us losing that eighth seat. Um, so we're in, a, we're in a very good position because if we, had, if we would have lost that eighth seat, that means that our congressional districts would have been a blank slate for the most part. And how do we draw that out completely going from brand new um, now it's, we'll be able to adjust the borders of those to make sure that you know it represents the communities, but we don't have to start from whole cloth and, and try to design um, what our congressional representation looks like from the ground up. One more question I have for you. The census did reveal that Minnesota's white non-Hispanic population has declined to 76 percent, while the black indigenous people of color and multiracial groups have grown to make up almost a quarter of our yeah. state now. Voting rights groups have filed a lawsuit seeking to ensure that people of color are represented in the redistricting process. To what degree should those demographic changes impact the drawing of maps? Yeah, so we've got, we want to make sure that our maps are representative of Minnesotans as a group. And, and we have a number of principles that the courts have been using for years and years. And, Everything from you know making sure that that the districts are compact, so you don't have those funny-looking gerrymandered districts where we've seen them in other states, Illinois, and and where you well that district doesn't even make sense. But compactness is one. Communities of interest, the you know all these different factors that go in. I think there's about ten different criteria that the court really looks at to see well, what does this what does this mean to make sure that we get one vote per person, and we're trying to stay in with everything from the, the Voting Rights Act to just precedent set by our courts uh, in the past to make sure that, that all of our maps come out very fair and the process that we follow is very transparent to everybody that, so they can't cry uh, foul on any of this. So we're, we're very cognizant of, of what's going on uh, in, in front of everybody. You mentioned that you have a meeting coming up yeah. in Lakeville, yeah. September 30th. How many more meetings do you think you'll have around the state, and why should Minnesotans come and tell you what they think? Oh, so I, I really enjoy So we got the opportunity to go up to Bemidji, uh, which is close to home uh, for me, and then Lakeville. For me, it's really a great experience just to learn about every community is different. Every community has something unique to offer. So come out, explain what it is that, that we need to be paying attention to when we're drawing those lines. So I'd really encourage folks to, to come out and be part of that process. Senator Mark Johnson, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the time.